So I'm going to introduce today's speaker who I had a pleasure of meeting with earlier today, and we agreed that I was not going to do a lengthy uh, biographical introduction because you don't really want to hear from me, you want to hear from him, that's the point of us being here. But I am very delighted to introduce you Dr. Harvey Rubin. Dr. Rubin is the director of the Institute for Strategic Threat Analysis and Response, ISTAR, which addresses strategies and responses to intentional and unintentional threats globally. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the founder of Energize the Chain, the nonprofit that extends the vaccine cold chain to remote parts of the world. And his talk today is about towards a global governance structure from infectious disease theory into practice. Dr. Harvey Rubin. Thank you. So I, I want to thank, thank you all for inviting me here. It's really been a very interesting day. It really met tremendous friends and colleagues, and it's, it's really been fun. So I'm going to try and convince you of something that uh, I would love to get your feedback on. Do, do we really need this thing we call a global governance structure for infectious disease? And here's how it all started. This is how I got thinking about this. A few years ago, uh, the House of Lords asked, asked uh, some of us to come and give, answer this question. Um, is there a global crisis in infectious disease? And they po posed the question as, um, a recent report on the communicable diseases by the UK Department of Health stated, Post-war optimism that there, that there, the conquest of infectious disease was near, but it's proved dramatically unfounded. What's your assessment of the overall position? And more specifically, is it simply that not enough progress is being made in reducing the spread of such infectious diseases, or is the global situation actually deteriorating? And so we got to go to the House of Lords and, and, and get dressed up and sit in this fancy place, and it was quite an experience. And I'll tell you briefly my answer. I started off by saying the global burden of disease is quite interesting, and the most important thing to remember is, in fact, that there's quite a disparity in healthcare and infectious disease. So it occurs for about 22% of all deaths and 27% in, uh, in disability-adjusted life years, but a disproportionate effect in the developing world. So where it actually accounts for 52% of the deaths and 50% of the daily uh, of the disability-adjusted life years. So there's a tremendous disparity in the way infectious diseases uh, affect our country versus the vast majority of the world. And in fact, it's getting a little better, but not much better. So here's the ratio of deaths from circulatory disease to infectious diseases. So more people die of, of circulatory disease, the ratio will be greater than one. Back in 1970, in the developed countries, the ratio is about four. Four times as many people died of circulatory diseases than they did uh, infectious diseases. Out of 2015, it's up around eight. Now, there could be more people are dying of circulatory disease than, and, and fewer infectious disease. But anyway, that's the way the ratio is going. Look at the developing countries. Back in 1970, many, many more people were dying of infectious diseases compared to circulatory or, or cardiovascular deaths. And just about in 2015, they're not, the developing world isn't even close to where we were in 1970. So there's a huge disparity in the, in the consequences of infectious diseases around the world. And the, question, the answer to that question is, is it getting any better? Or is there something really fundamentally structurally wrong that's making this thing get worse? And so I gave them a long list that I'll run right through. In fact, my answer was that it is deteriorating. It is not just at a stable state. And why is it deteriorating? First of all, there's an increase in antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections. There's an increase in zoonotic infections. And there's all the recent stuff you know about in terms of superbugs. This is a really interesting paper that was not written in this language. <laughs> uh, it, was, it came out in Nature. That's the problem with some of these transitions from a Mac to a PC. This is a, a map of uh, zoonotic infections and hotspots. They're clearly increasing. Uh, 335 new infectious diseases emerging in between 1940 and 2004. What else is leading to the deterioration in, the, in, in a global crisis in infectious disease? Well, there's, there's no harmonized regulatory processes that allows for the initiation and the in innovation of anti-infective drugs. You get a drug registered in the United States, you have to go through another whole process in India or South Africa or China. Um, whoops. There are clear disparities in the distribution of anti-infective agents in vaccines. There's we can't even make the diagnosis in many parts of the world. Um, we don't have enough well-trained medical workers in many parts of the world. We don't have safe and secure containment facilities in many parts of the world. I was on a Department of Defense committee, and they were, in terms of rolling out um, the countermeasures around the world, they showed us a security of, of, uh, of refrigerators where they were keeping bacterial strains in parts of the former Soviet Union. It's a refrigerator with a string wrapped around it. That's the level of security. 
Um, so, uh, of course, national insurgencies in failed states worsen the global communicable disease problem. And even globalization and, and environmental factors are changing the way infectious diseases are appearing across the face of the earth. Um, and there are various um, agencies, do-gooder agencies, really good NGOs that sometimes work at cross purposes. Let's get antibiotics out there. Let's contain antibiotics. So the, there are corporate and financial issues that are re, you know, related to deterioration in communicable diseases. We have no new molecular entities coming out in terms of new antibiotics. Big Pharma is essentially out of the game of making new antibiotics. And the global financial crisis clearly has diverted funds and resources away from uh, infectious diseases. Um, we don't have enough money to do basic science. We don't have really decent and adequate surveillance systems around the world. The reporting is, is incomplete. It's not shared. It's not interoperable. It's not real time. And there are whole new areas of biology that are opening up where new threats are being created just about every day. And that's the world of synthetic biology that I actually work in. So I think it's a good thing to do, but we have to be careful in what we, what we actually can envision. So um, the, the last thing that I want to talk about briefly is that the increase in counterfeit drugs around the world is a huge problem. We don't see it in this country very much, but if you go to the developing world and think you're taking something for malaria or, or, or tuberculosis, there's a reasonably good chance that you're getting either half-strength uh, drug or no drug at all. And it's just because it's big business in counterfeit drugs. And of course, again, social unrest um, and disruptions really cause wreck havoc. I mean, look what's going on now in the Philippines. So for these reasons, I said that it's really quite a deteriorating system. And in fact, it wasn't just me. That was back in 2008 when I answered those questions. This is a global risk pattern from the um, World Economic Forum in 2012. And they identified five global risks, environmental, technological, societal, economic, and geopolitical. Every one of them has an infectious disease component to it. Environmental risks, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Technologic risks, unintended consequences of the new life science technology, synthetic biology. Societal risks, vulnerability to pandemics. Economic risks, chronic labor shortages. Well, clearly what will happen in a pandemic is there will be acute and chronic labor shortages. And geopolitical risks, widespread illicit trade, including counterfeit drugs. So out of the five risk categories, all of them contain an issue about infectious disease. And this is a, a paper that, that we wrote a while back for uh, how much a pandemic would actually cost in terms of the gross national product. To make a long story short, about 600 billion bucks. So a pandemic is a serious thing to, be, to, to, to consider. In addition, the global risk map that the uh, World Economic Forum put together, right at the center of all of their risks is this thing right here, the global governance failure. And I'm going to make the case that, in fact, this is true even in infectious diseases. The fact that we don't have a global governance structure for infectious disease makes all of the things I was just talking about that much worse. So my answer back in 2008 was that, is there a crisis? And I, and I said there was not an, it's not an exaggeration to speak of a crisis. On the contrary, it's a medical, moral, economic, political imperative. I tried to put all the words I possibly could put together uh, to, to really raise this level uh, to the level of of highest levels of government and the, 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 the level of every worker in the field and every student in the field as well. So I'm thrilled to be here to make the case to you guys as well. So what does an academic do when, when, when a problem presents itself? We write a paper. <laughs> I don't know that we can actually solve the problem, but we'll write a paper. So this is a paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine actually in an, Indi in an Indian journal uh, a few years ago with Cam Rao. And we proposed a, uh, an enforceable international compact so there's this notion of compact, treaty, structure. That, that's for the, for the international lawyers. You'll understand what this means. There's soft law and there's hard law. Back then, we were talking about compacts, which is really sort of a soft law approach. A treaty is a hard law approach. And we could talk more about that later. But we said, look, we really, really need to do this. And what do we need to do? Well, we need to go out and talk about it. So I've given this a similar lecture, not the exact same one, just a year ago in The Hague um, with, with, the, with the same title. So it's really important to get the message out there and talk to people who actually can do something about it other than just write papers. And so what is our compact? What does our global governance structure look like? Well, it's complicated. But it really, the, the fundamental are four boxes. We need more basic science. We need better strategies for drug and vaccine development and distribution. 
We need better, best laboratory practices, and we need a much improved knowledge sharing and centralized database structure. The key thing is that they're all interconnected. The more basic science we know, then we'll have much better drug and vaccine development. If we have better development of drugs and vaccines, we better know how to take care of them. We have to have good and best laboratory practices, which includes ethical issues, by the way, and we put that in here. And it, in order to inform what kind of basic science we want to work on, we should really have better knowledge sharing and better generalized, centralized, accessible, real-time, interoperable databases. And so the idea of the, of the global governance structure is that if you want to play in this game, if you want to play in this box, then your country, your institution, your college, your university should also be playing in the other boxes as well. And so the incentive, actually, is if you want to be part of the global scientific community, your country should be part of knowledge sharing. Does this really happen? Well, it does. It is nothing more than developing world scientists want to do than be part of the global scientific community. It really is just like we want to be part of the global scientific community. There's no difference between us in that regard. And we, we propose that if you want to be part of the global, governance, uh, global scientific community, be part of the global governance community as well. And there are all sorts of details. That paper for The Hague was 50 long, you know, single space, and I'm happy to, to share that with you. Um, so I'm going to show you three stories that really address each one of those boxes. The first one is more basic science. The second one is going to be how do we translate that basic science into developing new drugs, the other box. And finally, how do we implement some of these policy issues? And so I work on tuberculosis. We're trying to make new drugs for tuberculosis. Why do we care about TB? You're, the, you're, you're the, the public health group. I don't have to tell you why we have to make new drugs for TB. TB is still a very serious disease. About a third of the world is infected. It kills more people than any other bacterial infection. People living with HIV AIDS, it's one of the major causes of, of uh, mortality. And um, many people will die without adequate therapy. We are also seeing not only multi-drug resistant uh, uh, um, TB, we're seeing sometimes even what we call completely drug-resistant tuberculosis. And, and you don't have to be living in the middle of Southeast Asia or Africa. You can even have it right here in Philadelphia. We really do need new anti-tuberculosis agents. So very quickly, you get exposed to tuberculosis. Some people will get infected, and some people won't get infected at all. About, about a third will be infected. Some will, you know, you may cough on me, but I'm not even going to get infected. If I do get infected, um, about 40% of us will develop primary TB. Uh, and um, the, if you're HIV positive, 5% if you're not. Many people would just stay PPD positive. Um, some folks will reactivate, though. So about 5% reactivation if you're not HIV positive, 2 to 10% per year if you, if you are HIV positive. Most people have a lifelong containment. So how do we wall off? For the most part, you get TB, and it goes dormant in your lung, and you're quite fine for many, many, many years. So the question that you want to ask from a, a biological point of view is, the basic science question is, how does this bug actually do this? How does a bug that, that could kill you actually get controlled by the immune system and the host response? But what are the, what are the bug's reactions to that environment? It goes into the lung, and it, rather than kill you, it goes dormant. And so what are the genetic and biochemical mechanisms in MTD that account for a phenotype where the organism can survive under the onslaught of a lot of things, including some drugs, right? but certainly including the immune response? And then how can we use the answer to this question to design new drugs? And so we thought there are two things that the bug has to do. The bug has to slow its metabolism down. It has to go dormant. That's its primary strategy. Um, most people who have latent TB, the bug is not replicating. It's not making new protein. It's not making new DNA. All of the usual targets that we think about in terms of killing bugs, they're not displayed on that organism because it's really quite metabolically dormant. Um, but even though it's metabolically dormant, it still has to maintain a certain amount of energy to stay alive so that its membranes don't degenerate. So how does the bug go dormant? This is a very, very long story that I'm just going to really go over very quickly. It goes dormant by the expression of a single enzyme called the stringent response enzyme, or REL. And what REL does, it makes this funny little compound called PPGPP, or ma it used to be called magic spot, because it has an extra two phosphates on the guanine and so uh, on, on the sugar ring. And it's made from GTP and ATP by a very complicated chemical reaction. The product is G5, or PPGPP, and AMP. The same enzyme can actually break this down. 
So why in the world would this, how could this enzyme that does this conversion be a signal to the bacteria to slow its growth down? What's regulating the enzyme to carry out this reaction? If you were just naively to say, okay, I, I have to go dormant. That must mean I don't have enough amino acids around to survive. So this enzyme may be regulated by the amount of amino acid that's around. And it turns out that that's exactly right. This small molecule, that PPGPP, turns out to be a transcription factor. So the more I make of PPGPP, I turn a whole slew of genes on and a whole slew of genes off, all of which are related to going dormant. So it's not that the PPGPP make, itself makes the bacteria go dormant. It turns on a big complex transcription map that makes the bug go dormant. And so some things are upregulated, some things are downregulated. And here's the regulation of this, of this enzyme. This enzyme is turned on when it forms a complex between the enzyme, uncharged tRNA, ribosomes, and convict messenger RNA. So this is the activity of the enzyme. We call it KCAT over KM. This thing is upregulated by about 80 times when it's, when it's bound to an uncharged tRNA. That means the tRNA is looking around for amino acids. It doesn't find any amino acids. It tells the enzyme, turn on your activity. Make a lot of PPGPP. Turn on that transcription program and shut down metabolism. So the antenna that this enzyme uses is uncharged tRNA, which makes a lot of sense. And in fact, when you put it in with charged tRNA, when there's a lot of amino acids around, the enzyme does its opposite reaction and breaks down PPGPP. So the ability to put on the metabolic brakes is absolutely essential for this drug, for this, for this uh, bug to survive. If you can't put on the metabolic brakes, you'll try it and go dormant, you won't be able to go dormant, you'll try and metabolize in the absence of amino acids, and you're in big trouble. It's like trying to run a marathon without drinking water along the marathon. You're going you're gonna to use up all of your energy, and you'll, be, you'll be literally starve yourself and, and, and dehydrate to death. So does this make a difference biologically? If you can't put on the metabolic brakes, Here's what happens. We knocked out this enzyme, this uh, deletion mutant in rel. Here's a wild-type lung in a guinea pig. These white things are tuberculosis, and it's full of granuloma. The, organ, the, the bug that got infected with this same genetically identical strain of TB that didn't have rel, lungs are perfectly clear. And so these lungs basically were infected, and then the bug just dies off because it can't stop metabolizing in the absence of amino acids. And this is the growth curve of the, of, the, uh, of the organism. It just sort of falls off. If you add back the enzyme, it grows quite normally. So you have to stop metabolism, but you still got to survive. And the way you survive is you make ATP. Whoops. And the way you make ATP is oxidative phosphorylation. And I won't go through all the details, but basically you take electrons and you send them down this chain and you make an ATP with an enzyme called ATP synthase. And so we, we study this thing very, very carefully. And we're mostly interested in this first enzyme. This is the most important enzyme, NADH oxidoreductase. There's two crystal structures out there. One crystal structure that has the business end on one side of the, of the flavin, and another structure where you can't really see this, but the other structure where the business end straddles the flavin. And this may not sound interesting to people who aren't biochemists and structural biologists, but I got to tell you, this has caused a big uproar in, in the scientific community who worry about this kind of pathway. Because they're two completely different structures. So who, which one is right? Well, we now know, we, we just sent this paper out for publication using some very nice uh, biochemistry. My colleagues and I actually now know, in fact, that there are two sites. So the second structure that I showed you is the correct structure. The two, the business end on straddle that FAD. Why is that important? That's really critical for drug development. And so that's the, the major story. There, this pathway, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, is key for new TB drugs. Anybody hear about the new drug Sertura or bedaquiline? It's the latest drug for tuberculosis. It works by stopping ATP synthesis in the bacteria. So you might say, for years people said, I can't do this because mitochondria make ATP as well. And so I never can kill off ATP because I'll kill your mitochondria. It turns out, in fact, that this drug is very, very specific for the TB ATP synthase. And when Johnson & Johnson published this and then quickly went to clinical trials, this drug is an outstanding drug for multidrug-resistant TB. And it opened up the whole oxidative phosphorylation pathway as a target for TB drug development. 
And so this is the pathway again. The nice thing about the pathway is you can assay many, many, many sites along the pathway in a single reaction. And we do that. We can now screen tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of compounds for inhibitors of ATP synthesis. And we'll find many, many targets along the way. This is the enzyme that the bedaquiline hits, but many other enzymes can be hit in that pathway as well. And in fact, we found about seven or eight new compounds that are very, very strong inhibitors of ATP synthesis with very little inhibitory capacity in terms of cytotoxicity. So we've got these new compounds uh, by screening about 200,000 compounds in a library. The question is, how do we push them forward in drug development? And that's a really serious and important hard question to answer that I'll get back to maybe at the end. Um, so we've also now uh, screened compounds from AstraZeneca, and we're finding several really good compounds against, like, these are our compounds, the new compounds from AZ. We have about three or four new scaffolds for, from their library. And here's a, a, a patient that I want to show you. This is not tuberculosis. This is mycobacterium abscessus. This was a guy who was a, a jazz piano player who had M. abscessus in his leg. And the surgeon said, the only way to cure you is to cut your leg off. And he said, absolutely not. I can't play the piano if you cut my leg off. And so he said, why don't you try a, a drug, an old drug called clofazamine? Nobody knew how clofazamine worked. Turned out, we, uh, my colleagues, Pablo Tebas, started treating him with clofazamine. And within a month, all these things were healed. It's absolutely amazing. How does clofazamine work? Clofazamine works along the same oxidative phosphorylation pathway. Clofazamine steals electrons from NADH, and instead of going down the chain to make ATP, clofazamine takes it and makes reactive oxygen species. So we now know how clofazamine works, and we're designing next generation clofazamines because we have a generally good idea of what that structure, that enzyme, looks like. We know where these things bind because we did the biochemistry. There's two binding sites. And we can now think about making new clofazamine agents that would be even better than the existing clofazamines. So doing basic biochemistry and basic structural biology actually gets you to the end point if you pursue it long enough. So we've done the same thing in other kinds of organisms. We have done it in gram-negatives and gram-positives. Because remember, antibiotic resistance is a huge public health issue. It's an I think probably in our country, that is one of the major public health concerns that, that we have as a community. And we really do need new antibiotics. So these are the guys that did the science. This is what they're doing now while I'm down here at Drexel instead of being in the lab. Um, and and, and you know, a lot of the work was done by, by many of these students, and so we, we have to thank all of them. So now, how do we turn this into a real policy? How do we solve the bigger problem of global health and public health? So we're working on basic science. We're trying to translate that into new drugs. But then what do we do with the drug? How do we get it out to people who really need it? How do we do this? And so let's switch our attention away from a drug to a vaccine, OK? How many people here got vaccinated as kids? Everybody, right. And you got a good vaccine, and it's effective, and you know you're not going to get measles and all that. You're not going to get polio. How many kids in the world die of vaccine-preventable deaths? Anyone want to take a guess? Uh, 100,000, 500,000, 2 million. Two and a half million kids. Two and a half million kids a year die of vaccine-preventable deaths. So why is that? That's, that is a shocking number. They shouldn't be dying. They die because they're, getting, they're either not getting vaccinated because they live in very remote parts of the world, or they're getting vaccinated with vaccines that have been cooked in the sun as the, as the healthcare worker tries to bring it from the main central location to the village. And so how do you think about distributing vaccines that have been kept at the appropriate temperature, which is between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, until the kid gets the, the vaccine. So I work, in a vac you know, I work in a travel clinic in Chestnut Hill. I take the vaccines from Penn. I put it in a nice cold pack. I put it in my car. I run out to Chestnut Hill, give my vaccines, throw it back in the refrigerator. Next day, it's back, and it's fine. That doesn't happen in the hinterlands of Kenya, <laughs> right? So how do you solve that problem? So this is a, the, an issue of one small part, the equitable distribution. Of, of vaccines, and in fact, drugs and everything else that we do as well. So here's the problem. These are preventable diseases, pneumococcus, rotavirus, measles, uh, influenza, pertussis, tetanus, polio, um, and there are more vaccines coming down the pike, right? So how do we make sure 
that these numbers of, of, of under-vaccinated, under five kids don't die. This is data from, from Gavi. The problem is the cold chain. We don't know how to keep these things cold because there's no power. There's no way to get electricity out to the most you know, remote parts of the world in a reliable way. This is how um, vaccines are delivered in a lot of parts of the world. A healthcare worker loads them up on, on her camel, sticks them in these ice line refrigerators, and walks out to the you know, 10 kilometers to give it to the kid in the village. Or maybe puts on a motorcycle or something like that. And so the farther away you go from the central storage station, the more degraded the cold chain becomes. And so the national airport, pretty good. Primary vaccine storage, okay. They have, they have big vaccine storage facilities. You start getting down into the intermediate vaccine storage regions or the health centers, the health posts, by the time you get down here, you've lost it. No refrigeration. And all these vaccines have to be kept at that reasonable temperature. So this is how it's delivered in, in parts of India, as a matter of fact. This was a picture one of my students took last summer when she was in India working with us on this project. Um, uh, in, in, uh, on a Rockefeller Foundation grant. And this is what a vaccine refrigerator would look like. You try and just keep it cold with ice. But that, everything I just told you about no power, that's all wrong. In fact, there's plenty of power in the most remote parts of the world. Who doesn't have a cell phone? Everybody here has a cell phone. In the developing world, there are more cell phones than there are toilet bowls. There are more cell phones than there are toothbrushes. Everybody, there, there's no landline. The private sector is now predicted to have coverage of everybody on the globe by 2015. So there'll be, there will be cell towers popping up all over the place. These cell towers don't work on cotton candy. They work on electrons, right? <laughs> so they work by having the power on all the time. The private sector is totally committed to keeping the power on. Without power, these guys go out of business. So sometimes they're on the national grid. They all have diesel backup. Some of them have solar, some of them have wind, but their whole business model is to keep the power on, even in these kinds of very, very remote villages. So we just did another thing. We just wrote another paper and said, you can solve the cold chain problem. This came out in the New Scientist in 2010. You can solve the cold chain problem by plugging the refrigerator into the base of the cell tower. We made a calculation. It cost about 60 cents a day to run a World Health Organization certified vaccine refrigerator. And this is, the, this is the cartoon that the new scientist artist put together. And I want you to keep that in mind. The cell tower, some joker there just, just plugging in the refrigerator to keep the, uh, to keep the vaccines cold. And so here's the growth pattern of, of the cell phone industry. In the developed world, it's pretty much plateaued. You know, th there's not much room for growth. In the developing world, though, there's an enormous space for growth. So this thing is totally sustainable and totally scalable. Our solution by plugging vaccine refrigerators into the cell towers is going to be sustained because of this growth curve. And it's scalable because of that growth curve. So we formed this organization, a nonprofit called Energize the Chain, recognized that 2 million kids die. Um, vaccine spoils because of the disruption of the cold chain. It's unreliable in the developing countries, but cell towers are sort of the solution. So all we said is co-locate co -locate the cell towers in the vaccine centers. It's, on, it's financially and envi environmentally sustainable. It's scalable, and it's locally owned. And um, it actually works. So last summer, this paper came out again in the New Scientist. We didn't write it. The guy said, OK, it was your brilliant idea three years ago working. And in fact, he went out and interviewed people in Zimbabwe and wrote this paper called Tower Power Saves Lives. And with any luck, this is what it looks like. This is a cell tower where the vaccine refrigerator is co-located with the cell tower. It looks just like the cartoon that the guy drew a couple of years ago. And it says energize the chain here. And now I'm going to try and do this. So bear with me. Life was not always like this. We were losing a lot of babies. A simple vaccine was all that was needed to save their young lives. But the vaccines needed to be kept cold from two to eight degrees Celsius against our African heat. We had to throw away lots of these and it was such a challenge. Then Econet 
through its Energize the Chain program, installed close proximity refrigerated containers. These simply use the excess power from the wireless base stations. Now, we don't have to worry about that anymore. By creating innovative solutions, Econet Wireless is promoting community transformation and joins the fight against the top five child killer diseases. Econet Wireless, inspired to change your world. So Econet Wireless is our partner. It's run by a fellow named Strive Masiawa. And um, he said, I, I, he read our paper in 2010. He, one of, he sent one of his engineers to a talk I gave in South Africa. Bernard Fernandez was his engineer. He said, we're going to do this. Now there are 100, 100 refrigerators are scattered around Zimbabwe using the tower power, using the energy from that. And I met with Strive a couple of weeks ago. We're going to roll this out in seven more countries where Econet, wh wh where it's the main, it's the main um, uh, wireless provider in that part of, of, in that part of Africa. Um, there was a meeting in UNICEF held in June, and they looked at three technical solutions to this cold chain situation. One guy from England said, I can do this all with hydroelectric power. It turned out that was clearly not scalable and sustainable. <laughs> the, other, the other solution was from Columbia University, the Earth Institute, and Jeffrey Sachs's gang. And they said, we need to put in place uh, solar microgrids all over the world, and we'll solve the problem by solving the energy problem, the energy poverty problem. And that's a really good idea. However, putting solar microgrids all over the place is hardly sustainable, hardly scalable. It, it would work in a few places but it means building a whole new infrastructure. And then our solution, which was just plug it into the, into the cell tower. And so I think you know, UNICEF can't come out and say this is the right answer, but it was clear at the end of the day that the cell tower idea is the one that really works. So um, it, it has everything that they want, sustainability, scalability, community partnership, and uh, it, it is now being rolled out in India. So my student Alice went to Karnataka State uh, the capital, which is the center, which is Bangalore. Um, she met with all the health ministers there and the, and the cell tower, Indus Towers, um, did a bunch of GIS mapping. We know exactly where the cell towers are in relationship to the health uh, stations. And we're getting it up and running now um, in India in, in, uh, for a population of about uh, 100 to 150,000 people. And this is uh, Alice. This is Alice in, uh, in India. You can tell which one is Alice. This is an outdoor vaccination. This is an outdoor vaccination uh, schedule. So you don't go to your doctor and sit in a fancy place like CHOP and get back. So you go, you run up with your kid, you go outdoors, you get a shot, and that's that. Um, it's really, really quite remarkable. Um, and hopefully, the, these, these people were throwing away polio vaccines because they were sitting out in the sun. There was no way to store the vaccine. So um, in, in our in our in our Energize the Chain, and you can go to www.energize the chain and see lots more videos and all sorts of things. Um, we have, we're really very lucky. We've been able to interest a lot of people in helping us do this, including the Wharton School, uh, the, um, the Professional Society of Cell Towers, um, Vodafone, UNICEF, Rockefeller Foundation, and so on. So we've been really lucky about that. Um, the, the issue then is, though, how do we really roll this whole program out for each one of the boxes. That's only one, I mean, it's a big deal. It's two and a half million kids. But each one of these boxes needs to be implemented. And how do we do that? So we figured the only way to do that was to bring our ideas to a much more global venue. And we could sit here in Philadelphia all we want and talk to each other, and that's all very nice, and go give talks. But this, the whole idea of the global governance structure really needs to be rolled out, I, I think, in, in a global way. And Fortunately or unfortunately, the, really the, the, the only place that does that, or one of the few places that do that, is the UN. So several years ago, we, we applied for a special consultative status at the UN. And we were granted that last summer, uh, which means now that we have um, the ability to go and provide expert analysis on problems that the UN are beginning to address. And some of you may know about the Millennium Development Goal. These were public health, mostly public health goals that the UN came in their infinite wisdom and decided upon, well, that Millennium Development Goal agenda is over in 2015. And there's a lot of excitement now and a lot of debate and a lot of conversation of where the development goals should go post-2015. And it's turning into an issue of, of sustainability, of, uh, of, of women's health, children's health, uh, financial stability. So there's a lot of new and interesting um, issues coming up. And quite honestly, we want to be part of that conversation. We, we think as academics we have a lot to, um, 
to, to sort of add to the, to the discussion. So by having special consultative status, we can go and we can, we can shoot our mouths off. <laughs> and so that's good, right? We, we, we should play a major role in advancing the UN's goals and objectives. We can go to meetings. We can re submit written reports. We can organize our own events. In fact, tomorrow I'm going back to the UN and we're meeting with the representatives uh, from Uganda and the Rotary Club to roll this whole Energize the Chain thing out in Uganda. It's going to take some time. We've got to make the right connections and all that. But they have a real interest in making this happen. So the ability to go there and have meetings at the UN all of a sudden elevates it. It's great to come and meet in you know, West Philadelphia. But it's a little different when you're meeting in the, in the United Nations. Um, and what's really cool is we have, uh, we have grounds passes to the UN in Geneva and Nairobi and, and New York. But the real question is, how do we implement this? This meaning the global governance structure and all of its parts, the basic science part, the drug development part, the drug distribution part, the vaccine distribution part, the good practices, the ethical approach to biomedical research in terms of infectious disease. This is a huge program. And it's not something that I can do by myself. It's not something you can do by yourselves. It's something we need to do as a community. And so where does the community live? So um, what does the community have to be able to do? Well, first of all, they need to believe in the, the need for a global governance structure. Second of all, it has to have people who really understand the cultural issues. And so perhaps really an international staff needs to be developed. Everything we do has to be based on solid research. It can't be uh, a solution that's just you know, uh, something out of thin air. It has to be based on outcomes research and really hard general public health data and basic scientific data. You have to have a commitment to, to the rule of law, to peace, security, economic development. You have to be able to synthesize what we may think is important, but also what the developing world thinks is important. So we spent a lot of time on biosecurity when I was working out for this Department of Defense Committee. And you know what? Parts of Africa don't really care about biosecurity. They really worry about diarrheal diseases that are killing their people. So being able to sort of approach the problem from and synthesize international concerns really is very important. You have to be able to convene across disciplines. And I think you know, if there's one message that I've been talking about today a lot is the business world has a lot to say about this. You know, international finance has a lot to say about this. The public health world, the engineers, the, obviously the medical doctors. So this is not a single discipline. You've got to be able to convene across disciplines between science, policy, and law. And again, you have to cultivate inclusive visions and, and, uh, of what the issues really are. And finally, you've got to be located in the right place. I put this one down here because I was giving the talk at The Hague, <laughs> uh, treaty organizations. Now, we don't have a whole lot of treaty organizations in Philadelphia, so you can, you can ignore that. So who has all of these things? Well, The Hague had it all, and they're considering this. Um, I can check off the boxes that Penn has and Penn doesn't have, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, the World Economic Forum can't do this. They really worry about bigger issues than they don't really want to get down on the weeds. OECD is the rich man's club uh, in France, in Paris, and, and they, they can help with data collection and all that, but they're really not going to get into the weeds either. You know, maybe the UN, possibly. Um, the G20 is the G20. You know, they'll, they'll make pronouncements, but what will they do? Will they actually commit real dollars? And luckily, I left the blank space here. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to put whatever university I'm talking No, but, uh, but you know, so after today, after today, and I went, met with a lot, of, a lot of you and your colleagues, you know, Drexel is, is a place, if you look across here, you know, maybe Drexel is a place that can sort of be the convener, be the center of all of this. And the reason I think it needs to be not so much in a place like the, like the Hague is because it really does require basic research issues, basic issues in ethics and biomedical ethics, basic issues in drug distribution, basic issues in drug discovery, basic issues in, in public health policies. And, and as far as I know, and I could be wrong, that the only place that actually does that is, uh, is a major research university. So um, I've been going around preaching that. Um, I can't say that I've been very successful in it. <laughs> you know, maybe some small parts, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a big, it's a very big issue. Um, and I think the, this is the sort of thing that has to be solved. Developing a global governance structure is not an easy thing. We can solve each one of these boxes one at a time, but it's really this cross-fertilization. 
that I think would really re be required to solve the problem. And you know what? This is a problem that can be solved. It's not like a problem that can't be solved. So um, I raced through this really fast. So I'm going to stop, and hopefully you'll ask me. Uh, I'll even go back. I'm happy to do some more biochemistry if you want. But uh, um, <laughs> I don't think they're going to get that. I'm going to get that invitation. So I really, really want you to tell me if you think this is totally crazy or what's wrong with it, and is there a way to make it better? That's the real goal for me to be here, is to hear from, from you guys. Can we make this a better policy? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to do questions. We're going to ask people to speak into the mic so that we can record. Thank you for that. And it, it does pull all the different pieces together. But as, as someone who's been on the ground in places like China and India, where TB is still common, a third of the x-rays one looks at, you know, you'll find it on there. Uh, it's one thing to talk about working on a, on a new drug in a lab. Then you've got the issue of drug companies that aren't interested. You know, how is it going to get out there at the end of the day right. to, to get to the ground in a remote village in rural India where TB is rampant to get this changed? Right. So your question is, the, is, is a question that requires days to answer. But let me make it in a few minutes. So the, how is it going to get out there has a number of time scales involved. So it being the existing drugs, how do we get the supply chain? That's relatively easy to, to, to solve. The problems that arise, though, are adequate diagnosis. And we sometimes miss. And that's, what, that's why this XDR thing came about, MDR, is that people were being treated with the wrong drugs because we couldn't make the diagnosis of, re of resistant organisms quickly enough. So there are some, some relatively straightforward solutions to that. The harder problem is how do you innovate companies to develop drugs to, to replace the drugs that, that are going, uh, that are no longer of any value. And so I was just talking to the folks from the um, uh, uh, Doctors Without Frontiers. They're proposing a structure of prizes to innovate, to, to, to incentivize companies and, and smaller companies to develop new drugs. So this notion of paying companies by the impact that they have in terms of the health impact, prizes, patent, patent pools. There's a whole bunch of interesting financial structures that are evolving and emerging to solve that problem of getting new drugs out there. The supply chain side is, is a difficult one, uh, but it relies on better education, relies on training the appropriate people, and quicker and better diagnosis. So, for, I mean, the goal for TB drugs are obviously stable oral medications. You know, nobody wants to develop an injectable for TB because of exactly what you're talking about. So I think injectables for TB are off the table right now, unless it's a very stable IM kind of, kind of formulation. But um, yeah, so th there are lots of nuances to each one of those answers. I mean, how do we train people? How do we make the diagnosis and all that? Um, but I think the harder question is how do you replace those drugs that are now of no longer of any value or, or actually quite toxic. Yeah. That was really a thought-provoking talk. And, and kudos to you for the, the refrigerator concept. I mean, you're, you're actually on the ground and, and, and doing just incredible stuff with that. My question was I was kind of surprised about one of the threats that you put up there, which I really hadn't thought about. And that was synthetic biology. I mean, is, do you, are you, is that something you're really concerned about? Am I really concerned about it? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I can tell you story after story about the, I mean, the most recent one, of course, is this notion of, of, the, of making avian influenza more transmissible uh, human to human. And, and that is, is, in some sense, a, a story of synthetic biology. I mean, not really. I mean, they made mutations and all that. But in principle, you can do that. So I was on NSABB in, for, for years. National Science Advisor for Biosecurity. And we got the first papers of reconstructing the 1918 flu. So 1918 flu killed how many, you know, 20, 10, 20 million people, 100 million people. Um, and it doesn't exist in nature anymore. But you can dig up a dead body from the tundra in Alaska, and you can isolate the, of the virus from the, or, from the body, and you can actually now resynthesize the entire viral genome and make it infectious. So who would do that experiment? Why would in the world that anybody make re-emerge you know, the Spanish flu? Who would do that experiment? Who would not do that experiment? <laughs> well, 
Well, a lot of people said that's a stupid thing to do, but people did it. And we got that as in our committee to vote on, should it be published? Should, should the technique be published? Should the sequences for the mutations in, in, avian, in H5N1 be published? So yeah, I mean, there are people who are really concerned about that. Um, and there are other stories that, that, are, that, that, you know, that you know probably well, as well as anybody else, about the kinds of things you can make that you couldn't make before. So I don't think it's a real imminent danger, but I think it has the potential to be a tremendous danger. But I, you know, it, it, and certainly the NIH worries about it. <laughs> Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so the 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 I, I want to get back to the retrovirus story too, in terms of in terms of synthetic biology. But that, remind me about that. Yeah. So so um, TB mutates pretty quickly, as a matter of fact. It has some very funny um, repair enzymes that don't work so well. So there is there is rapid mutation in tuberculosis, um, and in fact the genome is shrinking. So if you look at some of the later the latest strains of TB, the genome is much much smaller, and so there are there are essential genes that are being maintained but a bunch of genes that are, that are gone, uh, but every one of them has the OxFos pathway in it. Every one of them has REL, the stringent response gene in it. So we look very carefully at that. And especially the OxFos pathway is highly, highly conserved across uh, uh, not only evolutionarily in, in MTB, as best anybody knows, but even across the various different kinds of strains and species of mycobacteria. So, um, in the, uh, but that changes, of course, different other gram positives. It looks quite different from other gram positives. It looks quite different from staph, for example. But within mycobacteria, it's highly conserved. And so we actually just submitted a grant for non-tuberculous mycobacteria trying to do the same, the same story, because it's quite conserved even across the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So that's a really good question. These are really, really essential elements of the life cycle of tuberculosis, even in the rapidly growing ones that don't necessarily go dormant. Uh, it, it, the way MTB does. So you, you got to make ATP. Got to make ATP for sure. When you say you go governance, I thought I was thinking of something that would end up being a little more authoritative, kind of. You know, we have issues of that sort. When a new, when a new epidemic emerges and you can't get into some places in the world because there's war going on or you can't get in because the government won't let you in, other issues, they won't accept certain vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody that you all, you even talked, you used the word enforceable right, early right. on. And I'm wondering what you're thinking in terms of that sort of thing where you really need some ability to make people do what they need to do. Right. So we've stayed away from that. And um, I think Esther knows that several years ago, I chaired the City Preparedness Review Committee. We, it, we had real issues about quarantine. And when, when can the governor, when can the mayor say, who has the, who has the ability to make you do what they want you to do? So if you get on a plane in Greece and you have resistant tuberculosis, who is responsible for you to make you get off that plane? It's not clear. It's not clear. We didn't address those. We really addressed this issue in, in, a, in, a, in a much more, even as broad as this is, we, we thought a lot about what you're bringing up, um, and we took the personal the, we took the personal responsibility part of it out of there. We, we, basically, basically, we took the criminal side out of there. So really, what you're doing is you're saying there is criminal-like behavior, um, and we deliberately didn't go there. But I think, in, in, you know, if you talk about a global governance structure, that should be part of the conversation. You know, who who does have the legal who has the legal authority to make people do it right? I don't even have the legal authority to make a drug company make a tuberculosis drug. All I could do is think about incentives, right? You know, in, in the kinds of scenario that you're painting, it has to be a little bit more than incentives. So if you do have smallpox, 
can I make you stay at home or something? Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't really go there. Because <laughs> that's, I mean, most of this is way outside my area of expertise. <laughs> that is really outside my area of expertise. But I think it's an interesting point, and, and you know, maybe we haven't given it enough thought. Um, again, another reason to have it housed in a, in a university. So, Harry, um, this is very interesting. Thank you very much. I want to get back to the new agent. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, is this discussion is about how it's so new that distribution, certainly global distribution, is almost non-existent. And therefore, there's been no, um, no pressure to select our resistant bugs. And you made the point about how highly selectively toxic these agents are against mycobacteria. So the question then becomes, when you really distribute it on that basis, how soon does resistance emerge? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's a great question. And I can tell you, it's uh, by word of mouth, but from the folks who developed this, this drug, we are beginning to see resistance already in, in, certain, in uh, certain populations, and it turns out to be an efflux pump. <laughs> um, there's, there are, the, we ha the, you can deliberately make a resistance strain by growing it up and increasing concentrations, and you can get a resistance in the C subunit of ATP synthase. So you, it w and it turns out to look more like the mammalian strain, which is totally not sensitive to bedaquiline. Clinically, what seems to be arising is our efflux pump mutants. And so, which is maybe even more dangerous because now you're, you're, you're basically um, uh, inducing a much more global drug resistant pathway. So it turns out that it not only is it resistant to bedaquiline, it's also resistant to clofazamine. So that, that's not, you know, there's not a whole lot of published data on that yet. So um, this will be used not as a single agent though, it'll be used in combination. So that may decrease the resistance a little bit, but uh, you know, I expect that we'll start seeing resistance to bedaquiline once it starts being used in a global way within a year or two. So as a follow-up, what's the status of vaccine development, which has never really hit over decades? Yeah, so you know the BCG story, it's, uh, it's not a particularly effective vaccine. Um, it does prevent certain um, uh, sort of clinical symptoms of, of uh, mycob mycobacterial disease in, in infants. Um, there's a huge, huge effort now to develop a new vaccine People are looking at oxytrophic strains uh, of TB, so they're very debilitated. They're live vaccines. There's not much work, there's not much success yet in, in inactivated vaccines because you really need to set up a replicating system to get a decent immune response. So we, we dabbled in that with this rel mutant because it does, it, it's, like a, it's like a general oxytroph because it really does, it grows for about two weeks and then it starts dying off on its own. So there is a notion that people are making really debilitated oxytrophs, and, and they're beginning to go into clinical trials. So there's a, um, there, there is a lot of activity on, on, a new, on a new BCG. It's a long way away, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, student. Well, I'm a student. I'm just old. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, they, uh, this energized the chain. It, it's, it's brilliant. Um, I was wondering, do you have a need to expand um, the field range, like the guy going out on, on his moped to deliver, and, and um, maybe you're already doing it, but uh, rechargeable little portable refrigeration units at the, at the yeah. cell towers so that you do could that. distribute, right. so or, you or even maybe a little solar-powered right, portable right. So, distributed? So there is that ability to use these more remote stations to, to actually charge up some things that could keep it cold. Uh, and so the fellow who funded, who the Strive Misiawa, actually I was telling some, some the folks earlier, his new project is that he, th these villages go dark. And so he has a lantern that, guess what, is actually rechargeable with a cell phone charger. No mistake, this guy runs cell phone towers, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so we've been thinking about other ways. The one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to have the cell phone industry think they're going to solve all the electrical issues, all the power problems. But, but you know, it, it depends on the cell phone industry. You know, this guy Masiawa is just a really global thinker, and he's thinking along your lines, too. Are there other ways to energize the chain other than keeping a, a vaccine refrigerator right there? Could be a more remote freezer situation, for example, and just keep the things cold there and then use that. So yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. The thing I didn't mention about this is that um, Bernard Fernandez came to the meeting at, at UNICEF 
he opened up his laptop, uh, up comes a map of Zimbabwe. He clicks on a tower in Zimbabwe and he said, that refrigerator was just opened 10 minutes ago and it stayed open for four and a half minutes. So they can actually do, because it's connected through everything through the cell tower and they, they're monitoring their cell towers all the time, they actually monitor the internal temperature of those refrigerators. So what we don't do yet is we don't do real-time inventory control. We would love to know what's in that refrigerator so that the healthcare worker doesn't have to bring out you know, 20 vials of polio if they don't need them. Well, or if I did, you know, lots of things, right, right. I'm not a student. Um, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks so much for that. Very interesting. So I, I guess one of the questions I have when you think about global health issues and the, the tension between vertical approaches to solving infectious disease problems and, and, and the emphasis now on these horizontal approaches to thinking about healthcare system strengthening. I'm wondering and thinking, how do you place your model, your framework into that? And, and, and maybe that's a way of thinking about getting traction for this right, in terms right. of interest. So maybe if, if I can, so you're talking about capacity building is sort of like the other, that, that's sort of the other buzzword that people worry about. And, and, you know, can we build capacity in these countries so they could do it on their own, is, is, <laughs> if I understand what you're saying. So that's part of the interdependencies here. So all of this should be, locally owned, locally done, building capacity at the same time. It's not something we've focused on, and, and again, maybe we should. I mean, that, that, that's a great idea. Um, the, the reason I, I, I haven't done that is because everybody says that. And it's, it, you know, that's, that's like the cold chain. I haven't, I think we've solved that problem yet. Because <laughs> capacity building and horizontal, you know, integration and all that really means building up the entire infrastructure. Um, and, and it's the right thing to do, for sure. And, and I like to think that all of this is part of building up that, that, that capacity building. But, it, but we've not said those words out loud. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, right. Um, it's, I mean, certainly the, the, the medical expertise is there, and you can do, do a purpose. That's a really good idea. Um, and, and it could be part of any one of these boxes, as a matter of fact. I, I, I would bet that that's going to come up in the post-millennium development goal issues, and that's a really, we have to talk some more. That's a great idea, Esther. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Verman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for your great questions. Please join us out in the lobby for some refreshments and talk further. Thank you again. Thank you. So, thank you.